Let's talk trial strategy. Here are the charges against Alger Hiss, that he lied to the grand jury when he swore that he never turned over to Whitaker Chambers without authorization confidential State Department documents, and that he did not see Chambers after January 1, 1937. If you want to combine them, the charges are that he lied when he denied passing confidential government documents to Chambers in 37 and 38. Let's start with the prosecution. You have to prove, and this is a criminal trial, so you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, that Alger Hiss passed confidential documents to Chambers without authorization in 37 and 38. And under what is known as the perjury rule in federal courts, the testimony of one witness, Chambers alone, is not enough. You need the testimony of two witnesses or one witness plus corroboration. Well, you have Chambers and the documents, if they are believed, and if the documents are considered independent of Chambers, you have one witness plus corroboration. Maybe more independent corroboration would be Hiss's admission uh, that the four handwritten documents are in his handwriting, or uh, that the typewritten documents were typed on his home typewriter, if he admits that. If you want to, if you could cast your net wider for corroboration, you could be all of you could include all of Hiss's whoppers about his relationship with Chambers, uh, which can only be explained by his wanting to conceal the spying, his hesitation in recognizing Chambers, all the stuff about the 28th Street sublease and the Ford car with the sassy little trunk, and we'll, as, as we'll see, other incidents between the two men. Um, and maybe Mrs. Chambers can remember seeing Hiss and Chambers together after January 1, 1937, making her a second witness to count two in the indictment. So the elements of a prosecution case are there, if the jury believes Chambers and his wife. But the prosecution has a lot of weaknesses, too. Just Chambers' unattractive characteristics, his 16 denials under oath that this happened, his plain old strangeness, his love of melodrama, and how do you tamp down the suspicions that even if he's not crazy or he's not making it all up, you really can't ruin a man based on his word alone, because maybe he's just the kind of guy who can't resist brightening the pastel shades into primary colors to make a better story. You also have to overcome the natural revulsion against him as a former traitor, and perhaps worse, a stool pigeon and a turncoat ratting out the man who'd been his best friend. To do this, maybe you could say what Congressman Hebert said, that some of the greatest saints we had were pretty bad sinners before they became saints. And the only way you can uncover conspiracies like this is having people who were in them tell the story. There are some people who say that it was a big weakness in the process, and this was Professor Younger, a very smart man, said this, uh, that there was a big problem in that Chambers had always said that he left communism in 1937 until he produced the documents that are dated in 38, and suddenly he begins saying, oh yes, it was 1938. Um, how to explain Chambers changing his testimony, maybe the documents were ones he got from somebody else in the State Department, he's trying to pin them on his. Chambers uh, can try to explain that change in various ways. He said maybe, he could have said, um, when I said 37 in the beginning, I was trying to send a little signal to Mr. Hiss, I wasn't talking about the spying. Um, another answer that was favored by Murray Kempton is it's ridiculous to put a single date on something or even a single year on as slow and gradual a process as disillusionment with an ideology. It's like asking for the date for the moment that you fell out of love or stopped being a Catholic and became a Protestant. This is something that happens over a long period of time. Um, it's unfortunately true that on this matter, Professor Younger was simply wrong. It is not true that Chambers first said 1938 when he produced the documents. He said 1938 as early as his August 25 testimony to HUAC, the televised hearing, months before he produced the documents. Also, if you read very carefully what Chambers said, and as far as I know, this is an observation that I'm the first one to have made, um, what Chambers says often, not always, is that what happened in 1937 is I stopped believing in communism. And what he says happened in 1938 is I broke from the party. It's like saying I decided I hated my job in 1937, but I didn't quit until 38 when I'd lined up a new job. And th those two statements are completely consistent with each other. Chambers at the trials gave a simpler explanation. He said, I forgot.
in the beginning. It's that simple, and hope the jury believes you. So we can sum up the prosecution strategy as emphasizing Chambers as prodigal son, reformed sinner. He did some really bad things, but in the end he did the right thing. And who's worse? The sinner who's tried to reform and tried to atone for his sins, or the guy who's still sinning and is denying that he ever sinned, who's his if you're the prosecution. For the corroboration, you have the documents, the typed, handwritten, photographed on the two films. Perhaps Hiss's admission, the handwritten documents are in his typewriting, are, are in his handwriting, and the typed ones are typed in his typewriter, and all the evidence about the friendship that shows that Hiss was lying about that. And never stop asking the defense to explain how 65 pages of spy documents got typed on the home typewriter of an innocent man. Well, how about the defense strategy? Well, the first lawyer who really sunk his teeth into it was William Marbury in the civil suit, and he said, I faced the lawyer's bet noir. How do you prove that something did not happen? Uh, prove to me that you did not rob a bank 10 years ago. Can you account for your whereabouts every day and every hour of every day? Of course not. Well, you have to rely on Hiss's reputation, Marbury thought, build it up with his resume, hope lots of distinguished people will testify as character witnesses, these people say, I knew Mr. Hiss in the past or today, and I know a lot of other people who know him, and they all think very highly of him, great reputation for honesty, loyalty, loyalty and integrity, and such a man is not likely to commit perjury. Second, of course, you have to destroy Chambers. Find out every bad deed he ever committed. Portray him as a rat, a backstabber, a man who ruined the life of his best friend by making public all the little details of his friend's family life that he, that he was trusted with, and paint him as a, a fanatical anti-communist, just as he used to be a fanatical communist, and hint that the man's simply unbalanced. If you can, prove that he's mentally ill. Um, and ask, are you willing to destroy a man with the record of Alger Hiss based on the word of Whitaker Chambers with his record? Um, relatively minor points, perhaps, are if, if Hiss is guilty, he's acted in a way that's insane, coming before HUAC and offering to answer any questions, uh, volunteering about the, uh, about the rug, which we'll get into later, um, telling his lawyers to turn all the documents over to the Justice Department, always seeking a greater investigation of the truth, obviously not a guilty man. The Hiss defense also decided, apparently, um, that only fine upstanding citizens would be witnesses for the Hiss defense. And the Hiss defense was approached from time to time by pornographers or other denizens of the lower orders of society who offered up dirt on chambers. And the Hiss defense did not call them as witnesses. And I think they decided only top drawer ladies and gentlemen will testify for Alger Hiss because that's the world in which Alger Hiss lives and all the weirdos and the commies and the wackos are on the prosecution side. The final precept of the Hiss defense was consistent with what he said to HUAC to express nothing but hatred and contempt for communists and communism. So that's the defense, but there are problems with all of it. You know, having an excellent reputation is not inconsistent with spying or breaking the law or betraying your country. George Washington and all the founding fathers were traitors to the nation of their birth. Uh, lots of people of high principle have broken the laws of man to serve some higher law. Just think of Dr. King in Birmingham jail. Uh, also, the grand jury saw lots of the bad side of Chambers. In fact, he lied to them under oath, but they ultimately believed, they heard him vaporize about the gods of justice and the gods of mercy, but they ultimately believed him. Now, of course, the defense need not put on any evidence at all. Hiss is innocent until proven guilty, and the prosecution has to prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But if you do want to do more than just rest on that and put your own story forward, you have to explain a lot of things that are difficult to explain. One thing is Hiss's relationship with Chambers, even the relationship he was willing to admit. Isn't Alger Hiss the kind of person who associates only with top people who went to Harvard and his friends are Dean Acheson and Felix Frankfurter and Justice Holmes and Franklin and Eleanor? And Everything we think we know about Alger Hiss makes us think that if he saw Chambers coming, he'd cross the street to avoid him, this mangy man with a mouthful of rotting teeth. And he has no, Hiss has no history of, be, of befriending down-at-the-heels journalists and renting them apartments at cost and giving them cars. What could possibly attract Hiss to Chambers 
other than a shared belief in communism. And of course, the hardest thing for the Hiss to explain is the chamber's possession of the documents that were obviously prepared for spying that came from Hiss. And worst of all, the typed documents, if they are proved to have been typed on the Hiss home typewriter. The chambers came down the chimney and typed them up himself, didn't work to the grand jury. That story didn't work. Now concerning the four handwritten documents and the notes, uh, the four handwritten notes and the documents on the films, the Hiss defense decided to tell the jury that one of Chambers' spies other than Hiss gave them to Chambers. Chambers did say that he had another spy in the State Department. It must have been him, Mr. X, who came into Hiss's office when he wasn't there and filched the little handwritten notes from his scrap basket. Or maybe Chambers himself snuck in there and did the, fi did, did the filching himself. The State Department was a very open-door place in the 1930s. It had no security, however strange that seems to be. Seems to be. In fact, they used to leave the doors open at night in the State Department and the building empties, and you could walk in there and go to the bathroom if you suddenly were on your way home and had to go to the bathroom. But the fact that the State Department leaked like a sieve, or could, hits, hurts Hiss, too, because a few of Chambers' documents that came from the State Department never passed through Hiss's office. And Hiss would like to have been able to say, I can't have given those documents to Chambers or any other documents in the same batch or with the same dates. But if the State Department really was an open door kind of place, as it was, Hiss could have gone into other people's offices and gotten them. And while it's possible that Chambers snuck into State and took the documents himself, he'd have to buy some nice clothes and take a bath. And you know, J. Edgar Hoover or my grandmother could have walked into the State Department and taken the documents and walked out with a wheelbarrow full of them. But the single person who had by far the easiest access to all the documents, as we'll see, was Alger Hiss. A final problem for the Hiss defense, and I think a big one, is to explain what Chambers' motivation to lie is. There's no legal requirement that Hiss explain this, but if they, they, they want to tell a convincing story, they have to uh, say, why is this guy lying? It's throwing away a great job at Time magazine. One theory that Chambers, is that Chambers formed an alliance with the Republican Party at the start of the 48 presidential campaign and wanted to bring down Hiss in order to injure Truman and the Democrats in general. And this theory goes that Hiss was a tempting target. He wasn't too big that he couldn't be bought down, but he was big enough that he'd make a noise when he fell. He'd been associated with the parts of the Roosevelt-Truman policy that were hot buttons with the right wing, like Yalta and the UN. But this theory has problems. Fanatical anti-communist can tell the truth. Uh, the Republican presidential campaign in 48 avoided the communism in government issue. And the fact that Chambers' story helps the Republicans doesn't mean it's true. Um, if Chambers is a fanatical anti-communist, he can be that by staying right where he is at Time magazine, writing half a dozen cover stories a year in complete anonymity, not under oath, not subject to cross-examination and suit for libel. Um, without having to reveal his own past misconduct. He seemed to have no rational motive to lie, so the Hiss defense began to think of what irrational motive he might have. And, you know, sometimes Chambers seems like he's transmitting at strange frequencies. One of Hiss's lawyers, a guy named Harold Rosenwald, thought that, or began theorizing that Chambers was a homosexual, same as being crazy back then, and that he had lusted after the handsome Hiss, and when Hiss unfriended him, he, Chambers took revenge years later by making false accusations. Rosenwald wrote in a memo, the psychiatric theory's been criticized because it may be regarded as an unjustified smear of Chambers as a homosexual. Surely we intend to smear Chambers in any event. I have no objection to such smearing, and I hope that it will be very thoroughly and effectively done but I see little difference between smearing Chambers as a homosexual and smearing him as a liar, a thief, and a scoundrel. So is, well, do you think Chambers is crazy? Shortly before the first trial, Hiss's lawyer, Edward McLean, appeared at Chambers' farm in Westminster. If he wasn't invited, that's probably not an ethical thing to do. And he asked Chambers if he had anything else that Hiss had given him. And Chambers produced a piece of cloth and said that it was from a chair that Hiss had given him. And I can't help imagining Chambers holding the cloth like a holy relic and Ed McLean saying, okay, and sort of edging towards the door. 
But strange as Chambers is, there's all the circumstantial evidence supporting his story of the long relationship with Hiss, and there are all the documents. So these are the dilemmas of the Hiss defense. Before we get to the trial, I want to describe two important events that occurred not long before the first trial. From the moment Chambers produced the type documents, everyone was looking for the Hiss home typewriter the typewriter the Hisses had had at home in the late 30s. Dozens of FBI agents were looking for it. And about six weeks before the first trial, Ed McLean did what the mighty FBI had been unable to do. He found what everybody agreed was the typewriter the Hisses had had and kept at home in 37 and 38, the Hiss home typewriter. The typewriter that Ed McLean found was an office model manufactured in a big one, manufactured in 1929 by the Woodstock Typewriter Company of Woodstock, Illinois, and it bore the serial number N230099. Here is a similar typewriter, a 1927 Woodstock office model. And here, as best I can make out, is the history of the Hiss Home Typewriter. It was manufactured probably in the second or third quarter of 1929 in Woodstock, a suburb of Chicago. Not long after it was made, it was purchased by an insurance partnership in Philadelphia, one of whose partners was Mr. Fonsler, who was Mrs. Hiss's father. When Fonsler retired in 31, he took the typewriter and gave it to his daughter, Daisy. She had it for a short time. It came into the possession of Alger and Priscilla Hiss in 1932 and they had it for about five years. The Hisses gave it away to two black teenagers in Georgetown who were sons of their cleaning woman, Claudia Catlett. The two kids' names were Raymond Sylvester, whose nickname was Mike, and Perry, whose nickname was Pat. They're the so-called Catlett kids. The Catlett kids did odd jobs for the Hiss, Hisses and helped them move when they moved within Georgetown. And the Hisses gave the Catlett kids their typewriter, the Hiss home typewriter, sometime in late 1937 or the first half of 1938. And exactly when the Catlett kids got it becomes extremely important. Now the Catlett kids had kept the typewriter for several years in the home where they lived at 2728 P Street. What they did with it, as we will learn, is rather funny. Then around 1940, it was briefly in the possession of, their, of a Catlett sister named Bernetta, Pardon me, it was briefly in the possession of Perry's wife, Ursula, and then came into the possession of the Catlett's sister, Bernetta. She was not living with the Catlett kids and Claudie Catlett. She was living with and being raised by a Dr. Easter who lived in a house in Washington that was owned by a man named John Marlowe. Doctor, this is all about the chain of custody and proving the typewriter that Ed McLean found as the actual his own typewriter. Dr. Easter died in early 1945, and around then, Bernetta moved to Detroit and left the Hiss Home typewriter in John Marlowe's house. John Marlowe left it out in the backyard. It's about, uh, it's getting on in years, it's about 15 years old now. Even in the rain, a relative of his, Vernon Marlowe, and his wife took the typewriter and in February 1945, gave it to a man named Ira Lockie. By the way, I assume all these people are black and by now we're dealing with people who have never met the Hisses or the Chamberses. Now, Mr. Lockie, Ira Lockie, was a Washington trucker, drunk dealer, and night watchman, and he took the typewriter as part payment for moving services he provided to the Marlows. And Lockie got the Hiss home typewriter in 1945. His daughter used it in typing class. One of his grandchildren used it. It came back to him and was in his possession in uh, the late 1940s. And after months of off-and-on detective work by Donald Hiss, Alger Hiss's lawyer, Ed McLean, and Raymond Catlett in 1948 and early 49, Woodstock 230099 was found in Ira Lockie's possession on April 16, 1949. And McLean bought the typewriter from Ira Lockie for $15. I wonder if Mr. Lockie asked himself what all the fuss was about. Uh, we're not talking, by the way, about today's throwaway society. That a 20-year-old typewriter was in use in 1949, especially among poor people, is not at all strange. Um, 
I must add something personal here. I once met Edward McLean. He was a friend of my first stepfather. He came to our house for cocktails one night when I was about 15. He was a federal judge in Manhattan. And he made an indelible impression on me, but I couldn't place it until I went away to college and saw my first W.C. Fields movie. Mr. McLean was very laid back and talkative and country smooth, I think they like to say. He could talk a dog off a meat truck, and I can just imagine him walking through the ghetto with a roll of bills, buying drinks for people, and talking his way to the His Home typewriter and getting it for only $15. Um, by the way, the Hisses said that in the 30s they had several typewriters in addition to the Woodstock. They couldn't remember the name Woodstock, by the way. They'd only talk about this big office machine. They said they occasionally borrowed typewriters from other friends and neighbors. And the Hisses alleged bad memory about the typewriter and what happened to it troubled William Marbury. And he wrote them a letter to that effect saying, I'm, I'm really surprised you're not able to remember what happened to the typewriter or what kind of typewriter it was. And to me, as an attorney who's been in trials, that's a big red flag. That's what you do when you're defending a client who's done something, who's charged with doing something bad in the past, and you get the feeling that he's concealing evidence or suborning perjury or something, or doing something shady now, and you're afraid he's going to get indicted for that too, and that you're going to get indicted with him, and sending him this kind of letter, a notarized copy in the firm safe, is a way for you to disassociate yourself from that. But that's enough about the, final, the, the famous typewriter for now. And the final event I want to describe before the trial occurred in January 1949. It tells you a lot about what peop some people were thinking at this time. Onto the stage in this drama, for the first of two appearances, walks a name that will be instantly recognizable if you're a very senior citizen, Dean Acheson, who was the personification of the haughty Northeastern white Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite, son of the Episcopal Bishop of Connecticut, boyhood summer campmate of Alger Hiss, partner in the super prestigious Washington law firm that's now called Covington and Burling, Under Secretary of State, and in January 1949, nominated by President Truman to be Secretary of State. Now, in confirmation hearings before HUAC, pardon me, before the Senate, not HUAC, one of the senators asked him, do you have any opinion, what do you think of this Hiss Chambers case that's just about to go to trial? And uh, especially because lots of people thought that Alger Hiss and Dean Acheson were non-identical twins who'd been separated at birth. And Acheson comes on stage twice in this case and plays a role sort of like the chorus in ancient Greek dramas saying what a lot of people in the audience are thinking. And what Acheson said was roughly as follows. He said, before I answer that question, let me put some facts on the table. I'm not close friends with Alger Hiss, popular opinion notwithstanding. He, uh, he did work in the State Department at the same time I did and was briefly under my supervision, but we seldom had much contact. I was only a temporary acting something or other, and I was out of the country frequently at conferences, and he was in Washington. So it's true that he worked for me for a few months, but that gives you a, the wrong impression if you think it, we, we, we talked every day. I am, however, he said, close friends with Donald Hiss. And you may remember Don, uh, Chambers said that Donald Hiss was in the Ware Group but was not sufficiently developed for more serious underground work. And Donald Hiss, Acheson said, is my friend. And my friendship is not easily given or easily withdrawn. And he is my partner in the practice of law with all that the term partner implies. And you never know anyone completely and we've all been disappointed. But I will say that if Donald Hiss has ever done anything disloyal to the United States, I will be the most surprised and disappointed person in the world. Acheson did not say the same thing about Alger Hiss. So then Acheson said, having laid those facts on the table, let me answer your question. And he asked the senators if they could go off the record, and they did. And apparently what happened when they were off the record, they went through Hiss's conduct and then Chambers' conduct on the assumption that each man was lying and Acheson seems to have commented, they, they go back on the record, he, he seems to have said, whichever one of these men is lying started out by acting irrationally and then by adding to his lies and seeking a greater investigation of the facts, which can only end in his ruination. Uh, he said, uh, it, it, it leads you to doubt his sanity, whoever's lying. And then he said, and I think he spoke for a lot of people at this time, he said, one has a feeling that there's something here that one does not understand. 
It seems to me that there must be something that has not yet been brought out. There's some other fact in this situation which we do not yet know. And Atchison was confirmed as Secretary of State. Next, a brief review of the major characters in the first trial whom you have not yet met. And then we get to the first trial. <laughs> 